How we're going to proceed is we're going to have uh, the uh, members of the Minnesota 8 comment upon their uh, recollection. During this 1970, there was a lot of other stuff going on in the world. Much of it related to the war and the protests. And for example, the astute member of the audience would have seen that Daniel Ellsberg brought out a briefcase. Now, does anybody have any idea what was in that briefcase? Mr. Turchek, do you have any thoughts on that? Unfortunately, the uh, members of the third trial aren't here tonight. But I've heard that in that briefcase, there were a 1,000 pages of the uh, Pentagon study that eventually became known as the Pentagon Papers, which the New York Times then started publishing five months after that trial. So uh, is it true that Ellsberg was hoping to use that trial as a forum to release those papers? Yes, that, that's exactly true. He was having difficulty. Uh, he was getting stonewalled by members of the media and some members of Congress who said that they would lead, release him on the floor of the Senate or, or the House. And he figured what better opportunity than in a setting where he was under oath, sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, to release those papers. There, the entire document was not in there. That numbered about 700 pages. But I, I didn't know that this was happening. And I talked to the defendants. They did not know that this was happening. I don't know if Ken Tilson, our lawyer, who has since passed away, knew that that was happening. But apparently, they had discussed it in chambers. And the judge had told them that the, that study was not going to be admitted. OK. Uh, so, I kind of so jumped the, Oh, So the judge knew what was in that briefcase, apparently. Neville knew? Yeah. Yeah, they had discussed this beforehand. And uh, he didn't let it come in? No, but didn't say anything about it. OK. Otherwise. He said, not in my courtroom. Oh, right. Above my pay grade, right? <laughs> Hey, before we go any further, I want each of you to introduce yourselves. I'm Don Olson. Chuck Turchick. And sorry to make you a fibber, Pete Simmons, I decided I'd come up on stage Well, I'm glad all. you did. Brad Benneke. Bill Tilton. And we have a couple of cast members. Introduce uh, yourself. Tony Palumbo. J.P. Baroni. So one of the other things in the context of this is that the civil, uh, the war demonstrations followed on the civil rights movement that really gave traction in the 63, 64. And I'm, I'm very familiar with Martin Luther King and his letter from a Birmingham jail where he said that you can protest a unjust law but you have to do it openly and lovingly. So my question is a simple three-letter word that's very important in the uh, vocabulary of, of a lawyer. Why? Why did you do it? You're, you have the floor, gentlemen. Well, I, we, we had tried many other things. People had tried to, uh, and the war kept going on, and the deaths kept rising. And uh, uh, Nixon being elected on a, with a secret peace plan, and it just seemed that uh, uh, we, you know we'd had the huge demonstrations, and it was we were trying to be having a nonviolent escalation of our tactics to to and to focus on the draft, and and they, they didn't have backup uh, uh, for it, their their uh, files, and so it really was uh, something which could have an effect. In fact, <clears throat> the Wabasha uh, board, which had all their files destroyed that same night, for years, guys would come up to me and thank me, knowing I'd been arrested, but thanking me because they had gotten out of the uh, uh, ha having to be drafted. And, and the whole thing was uh, pushing the idea, well, if we have a democratic country, why not? have a democracy where people make up their own decision whether this is something 
that they should participate in okay. as well as that the country, country so, should do. So, uh, the rest of you, the gentleman said, you were not violent. Uh, wait a minute, you heard the testimony. There was chaos, there was vandalism. Did, were any of you the, the ones that destroyed the letters uh, 1 and A on that typewriter? <laughs> okay. Ah. Now, and, and, now and, you know, and, Mr. Tilson, we have some young people here. They don't know what 1A stands for. Those, that, that was the draft classification that meant you were eligible, and, and, it, and in that era, that meant you were going. You were going to get a, a deduction notice with, within a few weeks. And I'd forgotten that I'd done that. That's the first thing I did when we got into the office was to bend those keys as, as, as Chuck and Cliff were looking, looking for the right files. And, and so that's as much as I got done. And then there was a silhouette of an FBI agent with a gun saying, don't move or you're dead. It's the FBI. Now, did you guys conspire a conspiracy with each other ahead of time? Of course. I mean, we had to drive well, Wait, wait. You're admitting right here? Uh, to a conspiracy? Well, the statute of limitations is long past. Right? <laughs> we, we conspired as hard as we could for days and days. So, uh, again, Brad, you are 20 years old. You're a child. Uh, what motivated you to do this? There was lots of motivations, but I think one, one that allowed a a permission that uh, empowered me was actually a discussion I had with my dad, who was a uh, was a major in World War II. He's a tank. Yeah, wait a minute, your father, Arnold Benneke, mm -hmm. county attorney, county attorney, Republican, yes. major <laughs> in World War II. Yes. Uh, Where did you combat, go wrong? Combat <laughs> veteran. Yeah. So uh, dad was telling me a story. He, he as most veterans. Uh, it's it's a difficult situation, so we didn't have a lot of conversations about World War II. But he did tell me about when they asked him to go back uh, into the Korean War. And he told them in uh, not polite terms that there wasn't any way that he was going to do it. And it became clear at that point in time that you could refuse government edicts, you could um, fight authority, and I think that really was kind of the basis of uh, my beginning to act out at that, from that point on. By the way, not all of us were nonviolent, and uh, all of us did other uh, draft raids successfully, just to let you know we weren't totally incompetent. <laughs> well, wait, wait, now wait a minute. If I understand things, some of you we're not going to be drafted. You had high numbers. Uh, is that true? It certainly is true of me. My uh, lottery number was like 350, something like that. Oh, my gosh. So, so there was no way I could refuse induction. So, so that was sort of a motivator for me, uh, that this was a thing I could do. And, uh, you know, it was... Well, the enthusiasm was there, <laughs> but the planning was maybe. Uh, I mean, but know, that's a very important point. I mean, you acted out of not self-interest, but out of principle. Is that right? Well, I'll put it this way: when we were in jail, w awaiting trial, and l later on when we had were in custody uh, after our uh, appeals were denied, uh, people often asked me. What if, if I was doing this in my own draft board? I said, no, none of us were doing these raids in our own draft boards. These were about other people, not about ourselves. And they thought, well, that's crazy. You know, why, why, why did you do it for someone else? Now, I want to have JP weigh in here. He's kind of a youngin on this crowd. And, uh, but JP has got some memories to share how deeply this whole thing about the war and the protests <coughs> filtered down in society. How old are you, 12? I am the youthful member of the panel. I am 67 years old. Uh, so I was younger. I was the other part of the baby boom. 
on this. So, Justice Anderson, when we were all of us talking to Russell, what do we remember of 68, 69, 70? And, you know, Tony was more on edge of what it could do to him, but on a societal level. So, basically what I said was, just telling the story, I was 12 years old in 1968 in Moorhead, Minnesota. And um, the war, I suddenly had this epiphany in the summer of 68 at 12 years old that it was the fourth anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin and the massive escalation of the war. We had four years of being actively at war. And I knew my history well enough to know that was longer than World War II, longer than the Civil War, longer than any war in the history of the country. And it suddenly hit me, this is never going to end. And it became a very big point of discussion when I went to my dad and said, you're in World War II. Why is this longer? Now, my father's a son of Italian immigrants. He is not a man who is incapable of speaking. It was the only time I could, he just shook his head and had nothing to say because it made no sense to him. So that fall at school, it turns out all of us 12 and 13 year olds for the next two years, every day after lunch, we'd gather at this little clump of trees at St. Joseph Catholic Elementary School and we would spend our 10 minutes before we went back to class talking almost every day about the war and raising the issues of just how I realized later that that is whether you were 12 or 20 or 95, it was a pervasive aspect of our life and a hopelessness that had set in. Because after the four years passed, and Nixon's promised that he had a secret plan, why didn't he reveal it? And then there was none, and nothing was getting better. It's like, this is never going to end. So, so that I'm, was the experience of everybody, even if you weren't right on the front lines. So that, that's so, just... So JP raised a word, hopelessness, yeah. thinking it would never end. Was that a bit on your minds as you were uh, demonstrating? Well, it, it seemed to go on forever. I mean, when you could have 500 dead uh, American GIs pictured in Life magazine for one week, and, it, and the war seemed to go on forever, and the bombings got worse and worse, the B-52s flying over there. So it was a way of doing it. But we thought that if, by having it nonviolent and appealing to a, a different ethos, I mean, it took a long time uh, to change the opinion of America because the whole ethos, the whole media, everything was supporting it in the early 60s. I mean, I was going to go into the uh, uh, National Security Agency. They flew me out. The State Department flew me out for an uh, uh, agency for international development to go to Vietnam. But it was as people started to know the, uh, uh, the history of Vietnam, it took a while, but then gradually, finally came. I mean, finally, we, it took years and years. And we started to get a few members of Congress, but they they were way behind. And it, it, it just, uh, but it finally affected judges to, uh, as it got so many. Minnesota was one of the centers of draft resistance for six, 1969, 70, and 71. More than half of all federal indictments for, were for selective service violations. And this was having such an effect that as the people were coming up before the judges, the, the sentences were going down, down, down. Yeah, you know, you raise a point coming before the judges. In the play, there's a little bit of tension going on between whether it's Devitt or Neville. It seemed like the guys preferred Neville. He was appointed by Johnson. Devitt was appointed by Eisenhower. Uh, I, I will comment is, is that I received comments on how I played Devitt. Some people play, said that I played him too harsh. Others said I played him uh, uh, too mellow. Uh, Kathy uh, Garen, Judge Garen said, well, yeah, <laughs> maybe, you know, he wasn't mean, but he was strict. What are your reactions today with respect to the judges who handled your case? Well, my feeling, and I, I don't know if this is accurate, but in April of 1970, a few months before we were arrested, uh, Harry Blackman was nominated to the Supreme Court. And he had previously served on the Eighth Circuit in St. Louis. In May, he was confirmed. The chief federal district judge in Minnesota 
was Judge Devitt. And frequently, when seats are, are open up on courts of appeals, they are filled, filled by someone from the same state. And of course, Harry Blackman had worked for the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, so he came from Minnesota. My feeling was that Judge Devitt was bucking for that seat. Now, just as Anderson tells me that typically the cutoff age for appoint appointments to those courts of appeals positions were 60 years. So I looked up Judge Devitt's age at that time, and it was 59 years <laughs> old. And I think he was trying to rush our case in order to make a good impression. He had served in Congress along with uh, President Nixon. Both of their first terms in Congress were at the Both same time. Both in Navy intelligence. And uh, at the time of the first trial and the mistrial, that seat had still not been filled. Eventually it was filled, there was an appointment made on November 30th, the day that the second of the second group trial began, and a fellow named Donald Ross, who was 48 years old at the time, was appointed. So I think that Judge Devitt was appearing to be harsh because of that. But interestingly, when we were sentenced, Judge Devitt sentenced the five of us to what was called an A2 number sentence, I think. And that meant we were eligible for parole the day we walked into the federal prison. At that time, you typically weren't eligible for parole in the federal system until you had served a third of your sentence. But we were eligible for parole immediately, the five of us. In contrast, Judge Neville uh, sentenced the other two, the, uh, the, three, the other two defendants, uh, Frank Kroenke and Mike Terrio, to one to five years. They were not eligible for parole until they had served a full year of their sentence. As it turned out, they served a full year and got it after 14 months. The rest of us went to court and got the so, same date, so we all got out on the same date. So, uh, but the sentencing, Judge Neville was, was harsher than Judge Devitt. So uh, where did you serve your time? Just give me a quick answer. Inglewood, Colorado. Started in El Reno, got transferred to got to see Leavenworth Penitentiary, ended up in Sandstone. We were so notorious at the beginning. Not, Sandstone wouldn't accept any of us, and so we were spread one to a prison across the country, and I went to the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners. Okay. Uh, Tilson, where were you? Tilson. Til I, I was at Milan, Milan, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. So what was it like serving in prison? You told me that yesterday. That, uh, uh, you know, it can be easy or hard time. Was it hard time, or what did you do? I, I don't consider that, that I did hard time. I learned to love to read as a boy, and, and so people who don't know how to read or don't love to read they do hard time, because what do they do? They can watch TV so much, they can lift weights so much, they can play handball so much, and, and they do harder time. And, and so, so I, 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 you know, prison wasn't fun, uh, but, but it was certainly tolerable, you know? You just, you, you get sick of the, the, the library gets pretty sparse. But. So I understand you learned how to be an electrician while serving your time. The, the, the library was so bad that at one point I had to read, he's, he's heard this story, uh, How to Read Electrical Blueprints from the 1950s was the last book in the library I hadn't read. And so the, that, was, that was one of my... One of my so Brad, you were young. What, uh, your sentence was different. What happened to you? I was off in Ashland, Kentucky, and we had, uh, there's a whole bunch of folks from the East Coast that were radicals of various degrees. We actually ended up staging um, some f f protests that took place. Uh, we walked off of jobs. Uh, we didn't eat, those type of things. So we end, I ended up in solitary. Then I went to Terre Haute uh, and spent some time up there. And then towards the end of the sentence went to Sandstone. It... Uh, it was interesting down in Kentucky, only in the sense that, I didn't know this, but many of the people there were young southern boys and there because they had committed three 
felonies, felonies like stealing a car and uh, you know underage drinking, those type of things, and they were in the federal prison. And then you had a bunch of kids from Chicago who were there for gun violations and pretty violent things. So it was a real mix in the youth prisons. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to switch here a little bit. I'm going to. Oh, you want? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to add a little something to that. I was also. We were both in federal youth centers is what they called these places where the average age was like 20. Uh, there weren't any long time uh, hard rock guys in those places. Uh, but there were people from all over the country there, uh, very democratic that way. And it was sort of like being, what people told me was like being in the army. Uh, plus of course a lot of the people who were in with us were, uh, had been in the army and maybe had been uh, dishonor, dishonorably discharged or got in trouble for something later, but uh, uh, met people and spent time with people and got close to people who I never would have run into otherwise if I had stayed home unless I had gone into the Army. It was a real, it was like so. uh, traveling around the country. Okay, I'm gonna move to Tony, but I got, I say life is, Opportunities, showing up for opportunities, having the experience and learning lessons. You made your own opportunity by uh, 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 showing up for it, and uh, you had an experience. What were some of the lessons that you took out of this? Were you better citizens, you think, as a result of this? Now I'll get back to you, Tony. Uh, I, I, we're better people from it. You know, we, you, you, we, we all grew up as, as white Minnesotans. And all of a sudden, in federal prison, you're, you're getting all sorts of, like Brad says, you know, the, the kids from the, 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 the sort of hillbillies, you know, the inner city black kids and stuff. You know, it was, it was a great education. You know, at a certain point, it might have been a little like the Army insofar okay. as... Okay, as, uh, Tilson, I have a question for you. Hi, I mean, we, we go back, you know, a uh, long ways. You're an attorney. You are actually a pretty distinguished attorney. You've handled some pretty important cases. But you're a felon. You are a felon. How did it happen that you became an attorney given your record as a felon? Well, I am the first felon to be admitted to practice law in the state of Minnesota. And... Uh. and, and, and in order to do that, I had to go to law school first, and then you uh, are eligible to apply to take the bar exam. So I was betting on the come for three years. I was one year behind Chuck. Chuck started it. It's his fault. I just went in his wake. And, and, um, and so I assumed that after Nixon and Watergate and all those lawyers, including the Attorney General that took a fall for being, breaking the law, that who are they gonna tell me I'm not moral enough to be a lawyer? <laughs> but it wasn't certain until, until after I'd finished law school. And, and then, then I had an appearance in front of the Board of Law Examiners and they interrogated me and approved me. Okay, you appeared before the Board of Law But you know, Minnesota is just a large, small town. And St. Paul is a provincial uh, Paul, small yeah. town. I mean, you run into people. I mean, Renner was here, Devon was here. Did you ever run into those people? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I had the privilege of trying a Delcon Shield case, a products liability case, in front of Judge Renner. So the man had been my prosecutor, but, became but a yeah. federal was judge. he a villain? I mean, Tom Fable oh. says that he comes across as a villain in this play. Well, um, and Tom plays him well. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, he uh, uh, Bob Renner was always a gentleman. Um, he had a role to play, and he played it well. He, he was a true believer in all that. Um, but uh, it, it, he was always a gentleman. He was a gentleman during that trial. Um, I also tried a homicide case in front of Ed Devitt, the man who'd sent me to prison. Um, Ed did, Devitt, was I, did I play him too harshly? No. <laughs> no, no. Um, you've all heard of 
robes disease. Yeah, they, you know, they, they, people who get up, put on the robes and therefore think they're on a higher level. Ed Devitt had robes disease. <laughs> he, he, he was a, a very pompous man. Um, he was a smart man. You've got to consider the source, everybody. Central casting, good looking. <laughs> Uh, he'd, he'd done academic work that is still quoted today. I think Devitt and Blackmar is, isn't that at least for years it was it was a go-to treatise on the law on, on certain aspects of it. So I mean, he had things going for him, and he was proud of it, and 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 uh, he, he was very imperious. And, so. Tony, yes, uh, yes a lot of discussion in the trial about jury selection. You're a former county attorney. Yes. You've done a lot of practicing in state courts. You've done some uh, uh, practicing in federal court. Why was there this difference? Well, there is quite a bit of difference. Uh, I'm sure our panelists uh, have a good understanding of what occurs in federal court, and it is entirely, it's a totally different atmosphere. First of all, physically, the judge sits a whole lot higher, physically, <laughs> in a courtroom. And um, in federal courtroom and in state courtroom, you know, you can lean over the bench, et cetera. Uh, it is much, much more formal in federal court. Um, when there was a discussion about picking the jury, and uh, Kenneth Tilson in the play, you know, argues about how he only had, a, he couldn't ask the questions. Well, under the federal rules of criminal procedure, uh, either the judge or the or the lawyers may ask questions, but in my experience, do we have any federal practitioners here? Anybody that's tried federal cases? Well, we got somebody here. Good. I, I can't really see with the lights, but I will tell you, federal judges want to be efficient, don't they? They want to move now. You know, you start at nine o'clock. Hey, call your first witness, counsel. And uh, when they want to pick a jury, they don't want to leave it to the lawyers. They seem to think, you know, we can pick fair and impartial people. We'll just ask these questions, you know. And, and the rules say that, you know, the, the lawyers, you know, can submit questions that the court deems proper. <laughs> so judges will take a look at it. And maybe there might be an additional questions. But in my experience, judges feel they have done this enough. They feel they have a, a feeling for what's fair and impartial. Of course, most lawyers don't want fair and impartial. They want you partial to their side, you know. But judges will do that, and they will ask questions that um, I don't think a state court judge would allow. For example, I tried a civil case, and it involved, I was defending Anoka County and we're self-insured, and the federal judge at this point looked at three Anoka County jurors and say, well, Anoka County self-insured, now you as taxpayers, how are you gonna feel about that? <laughs> a state court judge would have had my head on a platter, but this is a federal judge, huh? <laughs> I would have, right? You would have, right? <laughs> Absolutely. About this study. <laughs> so, Chuck, you got the microphone there. You seem anxious to say something. Well, it was kind of interesting. In Bill's and my trial, uh, we submitted a list of questions that we wanted the prospective jurors to be asked, and one of them was asked, and it was a question that we shouldn't have requested. The question that was asked was how many of you jurors or prospective jurors are under the age of 26, which was the age that you would be free from the draft, basically. Once you reach the age of 26, you had no chance of being drafted. Uh, six people raised their hands, and the prosecuting attorney, U.S. Attorney Renner, used five of his six peremptory challenges, where he didn't have to give a reason, to strike five of those six people, and we struck the sixth one because he was a very conservative fellow. So that was a question we never should have submitted. <laughs> and regarding the mistrial, I looked up exactly what it was that Judge Devitt said when he granted the mistrial in Pete's, Brad, Brad's, and Don's case. And this is what he said. While it doesn't clearly appear that some of you have violated your instructions, some of you may have been talking about the case prematurely before it was submitted to the jury. Now, the implication I get from that was he was implying that these comments would have been proper if they had been, been said in normal jury deliberations, which I think is, scares me to death. <laughs> Say, Brad, I, know, I knew your father. 
I knew your mother. I mean, your father, McLeod County attorney, highly respected Republican. Your mother, I mean, she was a big force in the community. I mean, she was a dear person, and boy, she did a lot. And of course, your brother, Bruce, he went to Vietnam and was a captain. So what were the dynamics in the Beneke family as you were being tried as a felon? Well, we rallied. Um, they were supportive of me. It was difficult. Uh, there was a blowback in Glencoe on, on dad and on mom, no doubt about it. But uh, their son was in a difficult situation, and everybody stood up uh, from Bruce and the rest of the family. What was it like to have your brother, Bruce, a captain in the military, a Vietnam veteran, sitting there at the council table with him? Well, I was really happy that uh, he offered to do it, as well as my father. Um, it was unfortunate that they weren't able to play a larger role, um, so I felt badly, uh, in a sense, for both of them. Uh, Bruce had a difficult time. He had he had to go through some procedure to be able to sit at the federal to, to be an, to be admitted yeah. in the federal court. He hadn't been at that point in time, but yeah, I was proud of uh, of mom, dad, Bruce, and the rest of the family for so. being able to step a bit out of, outside of themselves and uh, stand up for another family member. So the rest of you were your family supportive. Yes. Yeah. Everybody's supportive. Absolutely. Were they so? Were your brother and your father allowed to appear in uniform? My brother was in uniform. Okay. Uh, Arnold, my dad was not. So, I mean, Bill, I mean, you're you're kind of old St. Paul, and as uh, you know, Judy Brooks tells me she knew your mother. She's a bit of a force. Did. Uh, did Judy Brooks play it right when she went through the marshal and said, "My son's in there." Uh, Judy did a great job. Judy, Judy was <laughs> spot on, and, and I can't wait to tell my kids that uh, I'm not in the play, but mom is. <laughs> <laughs> so, JP, you play a reporter in the play, and you said you have some questions about uh, the panel about how the press treated them. And it's, it's just the, base, the basic question is, at that time, the media consisted of daily newspaper, specialty newspapers, radio and television, which were snippets. Um, what was your perception of how the press covered your, your situations and then the situation in general? And I'm thinking specifically of how there seemed to be an arc of things after 68, 69, into 70, that it was in flux? Or did it stay the same the whole time? So your perceptions, each of your experiences with... Just one call out, yay Molly Ivans. <laughs> fabulous <laughs> woman, fabulous reporter. Well, well, wait a second. Who is Molly Ivans? Oh, the icon, Molly Ivans. She, she, she had her byline on many of those stories, uh, and she was a, a legendary, one of the best reporters in the country. She went on from the Star Tribune to join the New York Times. Hated the New York Times. Got sick of it. Out of and Texas, went, though. Went, went in, then to the Texas Observer, where uh, if she didn't get a Pulitzer, she certainly deserved one, and, and was one of the, the major sort of gadflies for the W. She's the one who nicknamed him Shrub. Uh, ah, yes. Now, wait a second. I'm not going to let that pass. Who did she call the shrub? Well, W. Uh, George W. Bush. Bush. Uh, there, there was a, a big billboard in Texas that was famous for... Molly Ivins can't say that, can she? <laughs> <laughs> because she was so effective at mocking the Texas, Texas legislature. She called it the ledge. <laughs> and and, and uh, she was she was something else, and she was here in Minnesota reporting when you're cut her teeth as a reporter here. Yes, yes, okay. she went on to greatness. Yeah, uh, 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 Phil Jones, who was in that press conference, he was a TV reporter, and he went on to national uh, uh, reporting with the national networks. I don't I know if it's remembered C Bill Jones. I, I, yeah, 
So we're getting a little close to the end, and I want to ask the uh, audience to ask some questions. But before that, do you guys have anything to say or you want to share with us tonight? Oh, oh, wait, I missed the biggest question. I should have asked this first. What did we get right and what did we get <laughs> wrong in the play? I think you were kinder to us than we would have been to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think after the third uh, uh, trial, the, uh, it was an, the people being convicted were mislabeled. It was, should have been uh, Terrio and Cronky, but instead it was myself. And okay. So that was just a minor thing. And, and the, when the one time when they're reading the headlines, it was, wasn't a flub but she was jiggling the papers when during the Aquitaineal, because of Molly Ivan's article about us, there was an article that said we, you know, that we should all be hung during the Aquitaineal. Huh. I mean, wait, wait, wait. They actually are saying you should be hung because of what you there were doing? It was a letter to the editor, and it was read off, but, but as she was going through the motions of moving the newspaper, you couldn't really hear it very well, but it was quite interesting that, and uh, there was a poet from the University of Minnesota um, who then wrote a poem called The Hanging of the Minnesota Age. <laughs> and so oh. it, it started, to be, he, he was in our, John Berryman, John John famous, Berryman, famous poet. Famous poet. And, uh, and Chuck, you have something to add. Yeah, one thing I learned from the play, I, I, I saw the play yesterday and I learned this, when the FBI agents were talking about uh, the upcoming uh, draft board raids that they had got intelligence about, they said, let's get the SOBs. And then when I heard the, the names of the people at the Winona draft board, Simmons, Olson, and Beneke, I wanted to jump up and say, yeah, the SOBs. <laughs> <laughs> Hey there. What, one thing that I noticed uh, early on when there, uh, the brief interview with uh, a director of the Selective Service in Chicago for that draft board raid, and he denied that it was going to cause them any real problems that all those files had, because, yeah, we, we have backups. Well, that was, he may have said that, but in fact that wasn't true. Selective service system was completely a paper-based system, hard to imagine these days, uh, but they did not have duplicates of these things. I guess they never heard of carbon paper. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that we did these things, or tried to, is because it was, had been proven that, as Don described, uh, people in Winona, their files, they disappeared from the system unless they went back in and re-registered Okay. And, and some actually did, <laughs> uh -huh. if you can imagine that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's why it was effective. It wasn't uh -huh. just a gesture. It was, uh, we called ourselves, you know, the, the press called us Minnesota Aid because that place name number combination had been used a lot by then. Oh, yeah. But sure. we called ourselves the Minnesota Conspiracy to Save Lives. That was what we wanted to be known as. Okay. And we would have. Uh, appeared in public afterward if we hadn't been thwarted and made uh, uh, So Brad victorious. and uh, Bill, do you have any quick uh, comments before we turn the house lights up so we can see if anybody has uh, a question? Brad, Bill? Okay. Before we get in front of you, as you reflect upon what you did, ashamed, proud, ambivalent. What is your feeling? Well, I'm often, I was often asked over the years, did I have any regrets? And I said, no, I didn't. I mean... No regrets? No regrets. No, it was... I, I uh, was wanted to stop the war, and I was... You know, Daniel Ellsberg asked me, like, what was it like thinking about going to prison? I said, well, it's like 
jumping off into a big black hole and you don't know where you're going to land. Chuck, what's your, any regrets? At our sentencing, Judge Devitt asked, if you had it to do over again, would you do it again? And all, eight, all five of us who were being sentenced by Judge Devitt said, basically, we would do it again. And then I returned the question to Judge Devitt. I said, if you had a chance to rule on the war and the draft as being relevant to the trial, would you do it again? And he actually answered, which I appreciated. He said, yes, he would. Well, okay. Uh -huh. I don't have regrets. Well, I regret it at the time that we were caught. Uh, oh, did you did you anticipate you were going to be caught? No, 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 no. Oh, you thought uh, you were going to get away with it? Huh? Well, that was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but it turned out so much better that we got caught. I mean, the much bigger raid had happened just a few months before, and that just sort of disappeared uh, from the public eye. But we were people in the public eye, faces that could be attached to all this. And so it was, uh, we, we were able to be vehicles for carrying this message to the public in the press and otherwise. And I just also say personally, I think, well, I felt like I was really lucky to have been involved in this and that I grew into a better man than I might have been okay, otherwise. Okay, Brad, a couple of concepts. Regrets, feeling lucky. How did you feel? Well, it was a wonderful thing. I was, we always try to pick it up, do it a little heavier, a little, a little more action, so it was a great thing to do. I would like to see a whole lot more of that today. The times that we're going through now are considerably worse. The country has devolved, and there are too many people sitting back, depending upon legal systems, depending upon Congress people, uh, depending upon moderation. And if anything, these are the times uh, for us all to be acting in the extremes to try to write this. The uh, fellow who is the, uh, what, there's a magazine called Wired Magazine. It's a high-tech magazine, but it's well-written and takes a look at uh, society. The fellow who is the uh, senior editor is just leaving on, on this after his last uh, publication, which is about AI. If anyone wants to chat about that, I'll chat to him about that. But the, and he's going on to do a study about the difficulties that countries are going to have in governing themselves going into the future for many reasons. And the fact that democracies are particularly vulnerable. And I think we have seen that. Uh, you know, in the last four, five, eight years. And hopefully we will all push ourselves to the limits and maybe even beyond to try to, uh, to write this very really sinking ship. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill one, uh, quick, any regrets? Um, no, I, I think I did at the time. Uh, at, at the time, 99% of my time was spent on above-ground anti-war organizing. I was co-chairman of the Minnesota New Mobilization Committee and the Vietnam. I was a representative uh, of Minnesota to national uh, anti-war organizing conferences. I gave speeches on a regular basis uh, to uh, high schools and churches and stuff like that. And, and what happened is during those events, people would ask, well, what do you think about these demonstrations? What do you think about flag burning? What do you think about draft board raids. And I had to be confronted with the idea that, well, I, I support draft board raids, then I have to do it. You are what you do at that time in your life. So. Um, it, it's interesting because the effect of our getting arrested had much more profound effect than any of that organizing I'd done. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's an unfortunate or unfortunate, but it, it, it was real that it, it heightened the debate about the war in the Twin Cities area, at least, uh, in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise. It, it also prevented me from becoming a politician, you know, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. I've told more than one politician that therefore but for a felony conviction, go I. <laughs> and I'm so glad that someone else is making the decisions, Jane Prince, about potholes and things like that, that I don't have to worry about. One quick question. The one of you, who, is, who had all the hair? How do you? Jane. Uh, yeah. Just a trivial note, if you talk to judge, federal judge Donovan Frank, 
who's on the board at uh, Landmark, and you ask him to go way back, he'll have a picture that looks just like you. <laughs> so I'm going to see if we got anybody who has some questions. Stand up and use your, ah, we got one over here. Use your outside voice. Connected to the sophisticated anti-war movement in Minnesota in that time, 70, 71. I was going to go to Sweden, but, you know, I had a lottery number, single digits, 71, but then the lottery was canceled. Happy me, but I attribute that to your work and sacrifice, and I took that to inform my work. I was part of Northern Sun Alliance with John Wilson, and I was in jail in 1978 with the Delano 20 with Mark Davidoff and abundant other people with Ken Tilson as my lawyer, <laughs> who got us off because we had a sophisticated movement to inform the people of Wright County about the energy wars and the bigger system, and nobody could be waived from being on trial because they were all informed about the issues, and we were acquitted okay. in 1978. And Bob Dylan had come out of retirement on stage at his theater, the Orpheum, to throw a shout out to the Delano 20. Oh. And we had abundant press coverage around the world because Wright County didn't have enough cells to accommodate <laughs> 15 people in the cell. And they were too lazy to have us do one call each. They gave us a phone. Marv got on a phone called Collect with Dave Dellinger and Liberation News Service. It became an international incident. <laughs> And Time Magazine covered it, and everybody was saying, Star Tribune, why have you not covered this at all? So that is a bit of a commentary on the time. I, I'm informed we have a priest in the audience who went to jail. Do, is, is the father still here? Very right here. Nice. I see at least one priest in the audience. How many do we have? <laughs> father Barry, is he here? Yeah. Well, this gentleman's a priest. He's identifying himself. I understand that you went to jail uh, a number of times, right? Yes. And how did the Catholic Church treat you because you were this protester? Well, in Latin, we call it persona non grata. <laughs> when, when this happened. Uh, we had a demonstration march from Nicollet Avenue to the courthouse where Kroenke was jailed. And I wanted to visit him a few days before that. And I said I was his spiritual director. <laughs> and the, the, the policeman there said you weren't, I was not, because I wasn't wearing a collar. I was in a black turtleneck. And so then when the march came a few days later, uh, I was giving a talk on the steps of the courthouse and the police marched down and they began to push the students off the sidewalk and off the street. And so I ran over there with my secretary and uh, when, the, when the policeman pushed the students, I grabbed him, and he, 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 with his belly club, he went to hit me, but he missed me and went back and hit my secretary in the mouth, and wow. she began to bleed. And then I said to him, do you enjoy that? You know? Well, these you like were... These were turbulent times, weren't they, sir? Yes. We've got to wrap it up. I, uh, there's another question that... Uh, One lady back here has been waiting the whole time. 
uh, stand up and use your outside voice. Come down the stairs just a little bit, because we want to hear you. No. no. Oh, where were the trials no. held? No, 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 the no, new federal Landmark building. Was not a, a courthouse at that time. Yeah. yeah. Were they all in St. Paul? No. The Some first, in Minneapolis? Well, for, for Judge Devitt's trials, the first two, they were in the federal courthouse in downtown St. Paul, not this building. Okay. The, the Burger Building. Yes. And, and uh, the Minneapolis trial with Judge Neville was in what was then called the new federal building in downtown Minneapolis. Okay. Here are real heroes. Harry Burry, Ken Tilson, Marv Davidoff, those names have been mentioned. Uh, marvelous men, real heroes Sir. of the time. Uh, Boatana, draft number 51. Um, I'm curious how these small town guys got together. I've never heard of how the eight of you united because there's an urban myth out of Boatana and there were several alternatives who wanted to be involved in this. And a couple were women. So were any women involved in this protest? And did you talk to any? And how did the eight of you unite? There were women. They were the ones that got away. <laughs> Which tells you a lot. Okay. Sir, you have one final comment, and then we're going to wrap it up. Well, we were all, most of us were all in the uh, anti-war movement. There, and that there have been uh, all these different uh, uh, movements happening. And you just see people, and gradually you st people start to understand who might be interested in something like this. And some of the people up here have been involved with the, the Beaver 55 action, which was, I mean, that took out the state headquarters, the uh, St. Paul draft boards, and the Minneapolis draft boards in one weekend. Okay. That's why the FBI was flooded into the area. And so after the student strike in the spring of uh, 1970, as things wound down, there would, then there was a, a decision made. We should we should take things out of the metropolitan area, and so we gradually, maybe maybe not keeping the best security. Okay. okay. But, uh, Let's give a big round of applause to the uh, members of the. Uh, hey, gentlemen, stand up, stand up. Yes, stand up. You deserve. Okay. Thank you all. You've been a great audience. You were from Winona. You were from Alexandria. This is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and